Well, good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation to be with you and how exciting it is to be at this conference at this time in this industry. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is to try to share with you some of the uh, ideas we're working on to try to accelerate knowledge sharing and translation from the evidence-based guideline and large population data sets into actionable clinical decision support at the point of care. And then describe how that, I think, implies fundamentally looking at the translation process and acceleration of translational medicine into high-velocity medicine. And then leave you with a couple of thoughts from a large research project we have underway at partners and across the country and with some international collaborators called the Clinical Decision Support Consortium. The headline, I think, for this talk is we really can't afford to have big data proceed without thinking through the issues of creating big knowledge. Big knowledge, I mean by that, inferring from the large data sets what actually are the appropriate rules or actions or inference mechanisms and knowledge artifacts that can be used in the installed base of healthcare IT. We're in the midst of the biggest health IT project in the country. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard about meaningful use and uh, the investment that the, the federal government's making, 19.2 billion approximately, in installing EMR and PHR and the like across the land. But in many ways, I think there's a policy hole in this ambitious goal or this ambitious set of policies. We not only need to know the destination in many ways that meaningful use defines, we need to have a roadmap about how to get from here to there with respect to use uh, of this information technology. So I'd like to take the opportunity in this next 10 minutes, an average sort of outpatient clinical encounter, to make all of you honorary physicians, graduates of the Harvard Medical School. The patient sitting before you, you have about 10 minutes to act, and within 18 seconds, you basically are starting to make your assessments and diagnoses of the patient. You have to recognize that 20% of the time there will be missing data, I'm sorry, 81% of the time there will be missing data on the record or the chart may not even be available. And you have to recognize that there will be clinical questions arising in this clinical encounter that you may not answer at the time of this encounter. So the simplest thing to do is simply schedule the patient for another visit. And thus, I think we see how the spiral of costs uh, in, the, in our healthcare delivery system arise. Any clinician in the room hazard to guess what this prescription says? <laughs> it's a cheap parlor trick. Uh, most people say Coumadin or something like that, but it's actually Avandia. And this is one of the problems with the paper-based system. Certainly the number of medical errors, the, inavail the inavailability of data from the paper-based record, which forces us to rely on the, on, on the only automated data we have for a lot of health services research, that is the administrative claims data. However, we need to increasingly automate the clinical data along with the admin data. And when we think about data and think about the big data space, you know, not only is the phenotypic data, if you will, the expression of the patient's uh, uh, physiology, but also the genotypic, the geospatial perhaps, the uh, social um, and other types of data as well. So the motivation for U.S. healthcare adoption of health IT you know, are some of the things I've been alluding to. 81% of the time in a prominent West Coast clinic, key data was missing from the patient chart. Lucian Leap found that 18% of medical errors were due to the inadequate availability of uh, healthcare information. We know there's an incredibly protracted course of new knowledge into practice. In some ways, it's been estimated it could take as much as 17 years for new knowledge findings from the leading institutions to be actually uh, part of routine clinical practice in this country. And lastly, the information needs problem. I think it's going to have to be big data and big knowledge so that we can not only serve up the entire medical record that's necessary for the clinical encounter, but also serve up the appropriate knowledge artifacts that coupled with the knowledge allowed the physician and the patient to proceed with effective clinical decision making. Now we've done a number of studies simulating the value of healthcare IT, if you will, large stochastic simulations looking at benefit cost ratios for healthcare IT of a variety of different types. And I won't go through all the details with you, but just suffice it to say that when implemented and appropriately used, 
we think, of course, that health IT can have a profound impact on the bottom line and healthcare costs. Looking at the value of decision support in ambulatory care, the value of health information exchange and interoperability, the value of personal health records, the value of chronic disease management, and the value of, of uh, telehealth. All these studies, based upon the best evidence and simulation models, suggest that maybe 7.5% of US healthcare could be saved with the effective implementation and use of HIT. This clearly is not going to happen overnight, however. We're on a long journey, and it's probably going to hurt. I love this cover from The Economist, uh, Dr. Obama prescribing to the country our, our current U.S. health care policy. And I got to say, I think it's, it's right and we need to continue because really the adoption of HIT is but a prelude to doing all the things that we want to do with big data, with reform of payment, with increasing personalized medicine or P4 medicine, as uh, Leroy Hood would say. But we're on this journey. It's an arc where we have to think about not only the adoption and effective use of the health IT at the point of care, but then actually using it to define and implement more advanced care processes like Alex was just describing. How do we use the infrastructure to influence decision making of both the provider and the patient? And how do we actually extend the infrastructure beyond just the confines of the episodic outpatient clinical encounter, or God forbid, hospitalization, how do we extend the infrastructure to consider monitoring or helping the patient in every context of average daily life, at home, in the car, at the workplace, at ever, whatever. So hopefully this is a, a familiar image to many of you. As we think about the big data problem and the big uh, knowledge problem, I think they're inextricably intertwined. As we think about data structures and ontologies and aggregations of data from multiple disparate sources, or even the idea of distributed query and the like, we also have to think at the same time, how will those analyses and how will that, that work relate to how we characterize or uh, structure and, and standardize knowledge representation? And then finally, how do we make sure that that knowledge representation is implemented in the EMR in the way that a patient and provider can use it at the time of decision making? Or even better, how is it implemented in a PHR? So at home, I can review my current status and make decisions effectively. There's a lot of work and a lot of literature talking about translational medicine, going from bench to bedside. Some of the, some of the most interesting work, I think, is I2B2, integrating biology to the bedside at Harvard Medical School, Zach Kahani and Ken Mandel and others. And I think that's fairly well understood. But I think the, the other issue is going to be accelerating this translation, thinking through the entire stack, if you will, for both data and knowledge so that there's a continuum as we translate big data into knowledge and it really makes sense. So let me leave you with just a, a couple of thoughts about a big research project we have underway at Partners with many collaborators around the place. We were funded to do a demonstration of this idea of uh, translating knowledge into practice and accelerating that translation process. The AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, funded us to pursue this basic goal, assess, define, demonstrate, and evaluate best practices for knowledge management and uh, clinical decision support. And the key trick is not only to do that in one EMR, but to do it in a way that might be applicable to any EMR to generalize both representation and then the expression of knowledge so that any EMR abiding by this framework could actually take advantage of these knowledge out assets. So there are many partners involved at this time. We're four and a half years in. The key academic collaborators have been Oregon and uh, University of Medicine Dentistry, New Jersey, uh, Texas, uh, Mayo, Kaiser, uh, and others. But so interestingly, I think the vendor community has come to the table uh, happily to look at some of the ways in which we're doing things and compare it to some of the ways they're doing things as well. So the first, one of the first things we did was to create a prototype national knowledge repository. The idea here is that we shouldn't have to all of us reinvent the wheel. Every time we implement EMR, if every clinician in hospital implementing EMR or PHR or other health information technologies 
if they have to rediscover what is the appropriate rule for the diabetes outpatient care management or the appropriate rule for the in-hospital deep venous thrombosis prophylaxis, uh, et cetera, then we're going to be stuck for a long time with a lot of interesting and, and really capable healthcare IT, but not yet fully populated with the knowledge that it needs to, to have the HIT have value as we predict it should. So the key thesis behind this work is that we can develop knowledge artifacts, represent them in a way that make them interpretable and shareable across different instantiations of not only one EMR, but many EMRs. And uh, in this repository, we've tagged all the content, developed a detailed schema for representation, allowing you to search and find content of different type and specialty types and whatnot. And if anyone's interested, go ahead and take a look at uh, cdsportal.partners.org. I love to see the traffic after I've been out and about back on the uh, Web Trends report. So currently, um, by the way, the knowledge management problem we've estimated in this country, if every doctor and every hospital and every clinic had to do that knowledge translation process themselves, we estimate it's about a $25 billion problem. That's not going to be tenable for the industry to, uh, to swallow. And while the vendors are moving uh, apace in this space, in, in tel Zinc's, Walters Kluwer, Elsevier, and others, we really haven't yet arrived at a common specification for this knowledge sharing and the like. The ONC, Office of the National Coordinator of Healthcare IT, has sponsored a project which I think will move us way down the field in that regard, the healthy decisions effort, which aims to have new standards based upon some of this work and others uh, available actually in the next year. So in our demonstrations, we've been fortunate to not only implement it in our own environment, our own EMR is homegrown currently, and we've servicized it, made an SOA architecture, if you will, for it, that allows us to externalize the knowledge artifacts and serve up web services into the EMR application at the point of care in real time. In fact, the biggest problem architecturally with this approach is not so much the rendering of the knowledge or its implementation in rules, rather it's collecting the data from the environment. A complicated environment like Partners Healthcare, it's 13 hospitals, uh, $7 billion organization, Harvard Medical School, teaching hospitals and the like. The data is all over the place. So when we think about big data, many of you have probably read some of the thoughts about how we have to think about the small data as well. So our demonstrations now are underway with UMDNJ running a GE EMR implementation and the Mid-Valley IPA running a next-gen implementation and the Regan Streif Institute, Wishard Memorial Hospital, Indianapolis running its own homegrown software. By the way, the internet latency issues are not problematic at all. We get sub-second performance with these uh, remote sites, for example, Regan Streif, and uh, again, the biggest problem is really the data acquisition. Another project based upon the same stack is being done now with Epic. Epic is the largest EMR uh, installed base in the country. Something like 40% of Americans have a record in the uh, Epic system. And we're doing the same thing with the Epic environment, delivering traumatic brain injury uh, decision support to the emergency room uh, uh, environment with Epic installations in, in six sites. So, in closing, I think the, the thing that I hope for is as we think about data liquidity, big data, and how we're going to exploit the phenomenal resource that it represents, we have to think also about its connectivity, of course, health information exchange and interoperability to achieve those benefits. But I also hope we can think about how do we couple knowledge with big data. So wherever the patient is seen, the appropriate knowledge is available, the appropriate data is available, and we can reduce dramatically the incidence of both uh, untoward um, medical error and excessive costs in healthcare. Thank you for your attention.